Thank you for coming. It's another NovaFlex webinar. Uh, my name is Matt Hill. With, the, with us in the room today, we have Martin Grohl from NovaFlex Germany and Brent Hipscher from NovaFlex USA. Today's topic is how to use a flat field lens for maximum macro results. So let us know in the comments where you're tuning in from. Uh, drop us a line, say where you're, where you're, you're uh, watching from. If you're watching this on a replay, drop that in the comments. We'd love to know where you watch from. And just a little bit of housekeeping. As usual, if you've done this before, you know, ask questions anytime. I have some certain times that I'm going to stop and take questions. Uh, and if Martin sees an opportunity uh, to let me know that there's a question that's really temporally great, like I should be asked it right then, he'll break in and he will let me know. Without further ado, I'm just going to say this is a great topic. Um, today, we're talking about uh, this lens. This is the uh, a NovaFlex lens. It's a 90 millimeter. Uh, it's actually a Schneider lens that they have uh, improved and set up to be uh, ideal for uh, the bellows that they have, the Bell F. So this is a remarkably small and light lens. The lens hood makes it look a lot bigger than it is. So this is the whole lens right there. The lens hood makes sure that you don't get any stray light in there. Um, this lens is ideal for a lot of reasons. And I put together a little bit of a deck to show you guys some stuff. And then we're going to go do some live stuff. So let's jump into that right now. All right, moving forward. What is the difference between a macro lens and a flat field macro lens? Well, most macro lenses, they try to make sure that it's flattish, right? But not every macro lens can do that. And honestly, the longer the focal length, the better the chance that you're going to have a, a flat field. But let's just take a look at what's happening on the right-hand side here. And I'm going to change my color of the drawing here. So right here, let's say in this hypothetical lens, it's a flat field, right? What it's doing is it's trying to shoot uh, as straight as possible, uh, as flat as possible. And most lenses are honestly like this. Unless it's a macro lens, it's going to have a curved field. It's either going to be curved that way or it's going to be curved the other way. It can be either way, actually. So in this case, uh, when you're shooting objects uh, that are flat or you want to do really important macro stacks or doing repro, you're going to want to look for a flat lens. And that's the topic of the day. So what do they have? They have usually a flatter front element. They definitely have the quality of edge to edge sharpness. The illumination from corner to corner, you know, like this, you'll see that it doesn't get dark in the edges. You know, it's going to be even illumination across the entire thing. There's very to little distortion, which is nice to have everything be rectilinear, square, flat, right? Wide open, they're generally sharper than other lenses that are not optimized for flat field. And once you stop down about two to three stops from the maximum aperture, it's truly, truly flat and even with no distortion or vignetting. So you don't have to stop down almost all the way to the end of the lens, which you don't want to do anyway. Uh, and, you know, this is, this is a good thing to know. They come from both art reproduction and dark, dark room and larger lenses. Um, so, of course, a negative or, uh, you know, a, a negative or um, in a carrier or when you're trying to photograph something that's a piece of artwork, you want absolute flatness. And that was really the origin of this type of lens. So let's move forward. What's irksome when it comes to, let's say you've tried to do this before and you were saying, I want to take a picture of something that's kind of flat or I want to take a macro picture of something that's beautiful and three dimensional, but I'm seeing these annoying artifacts, right? Uh, you might say I focused on one point and I expect the same plane to be in focus in other areas and it's not. And that's because of the curved focus field. Depth of field is not perfectly mirror flat unless your lens and imaging system is optimized for it, right? So I have noticed as I've used non -spe specifically non-macro lenses, other lenses to shoot macro, sometimes it makes it really hard to focus stack certain areas where there is chromatic aberration or spherical aberration. And that just, those are distortions of either color or perspective. 
So how can you tell if your lens is flat field? If you want to set up your camera and put on either an extension tube or bellows or focus it all the way to its close focus and then take a picture, you'll see something more like the top of the screen here. And you're going to see that in the corners, it's going to get soft. And that's, that's really what's going to happen. And something else is going to happen too. This bottom one is shot with the 90 millimeter Apple lens that we're talking about today. And it's edge to edge sharp and it doesn't fall off at the edges. Let's take a closer look. The one on the left is my 50 millimeter 1.4 Nikon G lens, which it's not really meant to do this, right? It's definitely not a macro lens. Uh, so I am showing you this because my first inclination was to use the lenses I have. And when I first put a, an extension tube on it and then a bellows, I was disheartened because the lens is just not made to do this. So you'll notice that not only does it get soft over here, but you start to see color fringing. Um, and this is a photograph of a map. So all of the little dots that you see here are part of the four color printing process. Um, the same blow up, and of course these are different magnifications, but this is a one-to-one -one shot with the 90 millimeter lens of that same map. And I have clarity and sharpness and no distortion. So what is this APO or APO designation? Um, APO is short for chromatic aberration. Uh, it's, it's when they create an APO chromatic lens to correct for the separation of chroma or color at the focus plane. And you'll see on the top level here, this is a demonstration of what cro chromatic aberration is. The red, green, and blue focus at different points in relation to the lens. And imagine if this is your film plane, those colors are not all focusing at the same place. Only the green is in proper focus. The blue is going to be out of focus and the red's going to be out of focus. A APO corrected lens, you'll see right here, doesn't have that issue. And we're going to look at it a little more detail in the next slide. But what you need to know is that an APO chromatic lens corrects for the separation of colors, which happens when they pass through glass or they refract. So let's take a closer look there. So now we can see that chromatic aberration is when the red, the green, the blue separate. And an APO lens, through its design and the choice of glasses and coatings, specifically places all three of those, boop, that's a really ugly arrow. I'll leave the arrow that I drew before. Is it right into the right place? And if they did it right, it happens across the, in, uh, the entire imaging field for the size that you're capturing. So here's an example of chromatic aberration. I just went into my Lightroom and I found some old focus stacks that I made. And this is the focus wheel of my Zeiss EcoFlex. And I was just taking a shot. And this is, again, that 50 millimeter 1.4. And I'm showing you this as an exaggerated example so you can see. But do you see these colors? At high contrast edges, you're going to see the colors separate. And you, when you, if you've seen that before and you're wondering what it is, that's what it is. And, and I got to say, it blew my mind the first time I saw this. Um, I knew what a chromatic aberration was, but when you push a lens to an extreme past its closest focusing distance, which the manufacturer provides, when you put an extension tube or bellows on it, you may experience that. And if you see this, that's what it is. You're also getting another aberration here, spherical aberration. So you've got those two compounding each other, uh, and it just turns into something that's really hard to focus stack. It might be beautiful, but it's really impossible to correct in post-processing. So what is the solution? Um, the solution is to take a look at uh, our offering, the Flex Apo Digi 90 millimeter F4.5 Apo lens. This is a special lens and head and lens shade system that are designed to be used with the Bell F bellows. Uh, so what are the Bell F bellows? If you're not familiar, these are Novaflex's uh, macro bellows that are universal in system. And we'll take a look at those a little bit later 
uh, in a little bit more depth. But this lens has been, uh, we talked about Apple Chromatic. It's absolutely going to make sure that the colors focus at the same place. It's been digitally corrected for digital lenses and not necessarily film. So it's, it's got the proper sharpness for a 35 millimeter sensor. And it's been mounted on the Bell F adapter, which means it fits right onto the universal bellows. Its maximum aperture is f4.5, and it goes all the way up to f32, uh, which is a one stop more than most macro lenses. It does enable focusing from infinity to one to one, and we will come back to that point. Uh, if you wanted to put a filter on it, it's a little bit smaller. In fact, a lot smaller than most macro lenses. It's only 40.5 millimeters. And also, you have the benefit of German engineering and manufacturing, which is very precise robust, and it lasts a lifetime. It is compatible with DSLRs and mirrorless camera bodies. Uh, and that's great to know. Um, and we're going to come back to it. This is a really important point. Uh, it's, uh, to use with the Balef out of the box, you can just put it right on the bellows. You don't have to do anything else to it, except take the rear lens cap off. Uh, it's really wonderful image circle is a constant 90 millimeters throughout the aperture range. Sometimes on other lenses, when you stop down, the image circle might get bigger or smaller. This is optimized for exactly what we're talking about. And the small rear barrel with minimum flange allows its use on a variety of cameras. What does that mean? Well, let me show you. The flange distance is the distance from where you mount it to behind. When I put this on the bellows, and I take the rear lens cap off, there's still space between here and the sensor of my camera when I move the bellows all the way back. So it's not going to hit anything. It's not going to damage your sensor because of that. Uh, right. Next up. This is also cool. If you want to go beyond one-to-one, -one, then you can simply use an adapter and add another bellows and you can go beyond that one-to-one -one magnification. Uh, thank you for this picture, Martin. I did not do this in my studio. They did this over in Germany. You might ask now, hey, I already have a macro lens. Why the heck should I get another macro lens uh, or even macro lens plus a bellows? Well, this is specifically optimized for flat field. If you're doing reproduction work, uh, from all the way from small negatives or slides all the way up to larger artworks, life size, where you're backed off in the distance, this one imaging system, the lens plus the bellows, is going to be the ideal solution for you when it comes to sharpness uh, and versatility. And we're going to come back to versatility. This 90 millimeter focal length is also ideal when you're in the macro range. Uh, for lighting things and keeping them a little bit at a distance. You can move your lights in and out and create beautiful light. Uh, and you can, if you have skittish subjects like insects, uh, you can keep your distance and not mm, make them feel as threatened with that 90 millimeter. Uh, you can go from infinity to one-to-one. -to -one. When you mount other lenses to the bellows, you can't do that. Regular macro lenses. They just, uh, because you're already the distance of the bellows away from the camera, you've lost the ability to achieve infinity focus. It does have that small filter thread. If you use filtration, this is an important thing. It's cheaper filters, right? Uh, and I really love the aperture adjustments on this. Uh, so let's take a peek at that. Uh, when, when you're using the lens, uh, if you're a large format user, you already understand this. Um, these are easy to see and you can hear it. Wait, let me do it near my microphone. You hear that? Very positive uh, detents in this that allow you to reach around the front and get your half-stop clicks in there and know exactly what you're doing for your adjustments. Uh, that I re really enjoy a lot. Um, this is the big point. This is future-proof. If you get this macro lens and you pair it with the Bell F Bellows, no matter what camera body you get in the future with a 35 millimeter sensor, you're going to be able to use it on that camera body. And this is really where the investment pays off. You're going to have an incredible, incredible, incredibly sharp lens 
that goes from infinity all the way down to one to one that's optimized for flat field, which is great for repro and for digitizing negatives and slides, but also for three-dimensional objects when you're doing focus stacking. And you can use it on every imaging system that's listed here. And there's probably going to be adapters for ones in the future when they come out. So I just want to linger here for a second and, and let that sink in. Every time you change a lens mount or change camera manufacturers, you have to reinvest in lenses. This is a safe investment. This is a, a wonderful uh, option to really stay with a consistent, consistently sharp and even and distortion free uh, macro imaging system. All right, moving forward. Speaking of systems again, uh, if you own other NovaFlex items, it's totally compatible, of course. Uh, but on top of that, the base of the bellows is Arca Swiss compatible. So there's also a quarter 20 and 3 8 thread mounts on that, which means you can drop it into any Arca compatible quick release system. Um, and you're ready to add this right to any of the focusing rails that you may own or may get in the future, including NovaFlex's own Castell Cross Q, Castell Q, which is one of those instead of two, or the Castell Mini 2. I'm going to show you mine a little bit later. Um, now it's demo time. Let me walk you through what we're going to talk about. I'm going to mount the lens uh, to the bellows and show you how that works. I'm going to focus at different magnifications. I'm going to show you the results of shooting some of those pictures in Lightroom Classic. And then we're going to process a stack in Helicon Focus. So, but now I'm going to take a moment for questions. Uh, Martin, give me a shout if anybody has asked any questions. Uh, perhaps I've been, you guys have been drinking from the fire hose and a lot of information coming your way right now. Um, but uh, this is the part where it's fun to get into the practical. Yes, I shared a lot of information on deck, but now I want to talk about what it means to use this. So uh, questions anytime you want to ask them in the chat. So here is uh, the lens. One thing that you may or may not be familiar with is every lens usually that we buy has both the front and the rear lens cap. If you've used large format, then you know that this is a pull-on and push-off cap. It's a friction-based cap, right? And on the front, this has uh, a squeezy cap, and then the front element's way down in there, right? So you know it's going to be very hard to get um, flare with this lens because of the generous and perfectly sized lens hood. So <laughs> my favorite mistake is to forget this, to take this lens cap off before I mount it to the bellows. Uh, so if you put everything together and it's black, that's because you forgot to take this off. So <laughs> let's just do this. And I'm gonna, sorry for the perspective change there, folks, but I'm just gonna switch that that way so you can see what happens. Because this is mounted uh, on a circular flange, you can then go straight to your bellows. And when you put it in here, you can turn it in any direction that you want. So that's facing the proper direction. And then you tighten down the set screws. Uh, I will do that again for the front so you guys can see it here. So in here, this is the lens. The lens fits right into the front of the bell F bellows. And then you tighten down this two. And I'm going to come around the side here to show you guys. If I wanted to see the apertures over here, I just turn it this way. If I wanted to be over there, I turn them that way. So. It helps. It's nice to have them where you want them when you're doing macro. So now I can see them from this side, which is helpful. And I'll point to them again here. So the apertures are right there. Uh, so, all right. So let's take a peek through the lens. All right. So let's change our exposure here. So what I have right now is... Uh, we're seeing a live video feed through the camera. This is, ex this is exactly as if you were looking at the back LCD of the camera or through the EVF. So that's what you're seeing here. Um, what I like to do a lot of the time is to turn off all my other light sources. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna turn off the side light sources. I just turned off the top light source here uh, so that I can first... Um, watch my histogram and make sure I'm not clipping my highlights, right? So I'm watching that right-hand side to make sure I don't clip my highlights. 
turn on my second light source. I'm still not clipping my highlights. That's fantastic. So the next thing I do is looking at the back LCD, I zoom in and oh, there we go. I zoom in and then I'm going to use, I'll switch over here to show you. I'm going to use the focusing rail to then decide what I'm going to do. Uh, so I'm using the focusing rail to move the camera. And now I know that I'm in focus at the frontmost part of the flower here. And I need to go all the way back from the frontmost part of the flower here, all the way down to the backmost part one. And that would mean moving the camera on the focusing rail from here down to there, because the focus is the same. The focus is the length of these bellows right now. So I can look on the side of the bellows here. I can look on the side of my my uh, focusing rail and note what the distance is so I can come back to it. I'm going to do that now. So right now I am at just under 20 millimeters. And we'll remember that number, right? So I'm going to go from 20 millimeters and I'm going to zoom back in again. I'm going to move my display over here and I'm going to go all the way down to there. That looks sharpish, right? And then that is all the way to 35. So I'm going to show you what I'm doing now. It's all the way down to 35 millimeters here. So I'm going to go back up to 19, which is where I was, by unlocking this and so moving back up. And locking that back down. So now we're going to do the fun part, which is zoom back out. I'm going to confirm my focus here, right? Make sure this is exactly what I want. It looks like it. Breathe it a little bit. That looks nice. Good. And now I'm going to do the fun part, which is to take a bunch of pictures, and I get to talk to you guys at the same time about it. So we're going to use uh, Lightroom Classic to do this. And I just took the first picture. I'm going to share my screen here. So here's the first picture. We're going to confirm that that's good. Yes. Yes, we have focus, right? So I'm just going to come back over to this screen every time I need to take a picture. So, uh, and we're going to try to do it pretty quick, but this is what macro is. So now you know the speed of macro. And what I'm doing is I'm moving about a half a millimeter each time. And I'm going to Move that. And I'm going to jump back out real quick and show you guys what's going on. So from this side, what I'm doing is I'm loosening up the focusing rail and using the scale on the back here, just moving it half a millimeter and then taking a picture. So I'm going to do that and we'll do some more of these. And I'm actuating the trigger from Lightroom instead of touching the camera. And I'm going to keep doing this until I get to my second marker and I'm walking around the front right now to check. I have a little bit more to go. And what we're going to do is we're going to process this one Let's see what we got here. Good. And I'll switch over to this, the screen here. There we go. And you're seeing me taking the pictures inside of Lightroom. And now we're going to check our focus and see if we got closer to where we want to be. It looks like we have a ways to go. Let's go back in the sequence some, right? No, we got a ways to go. So we still have to keep on shooting this. Okay, great. That was the
All right. And probably easier to see me over here. And I know that this is this is the most exciting thing to see live. <laughs> but this, this folks, this is macro. This is what it means. You can imagine why the, the night photographer in me also enjoys macro because I enjoy things that are sometimes considered tediously technical, right? Uh, and require patience and enjoying the end result as well as the journey to getting there. And that's a lot of what I find in macro. So we're closer. Perhaps we only want to have the bulb in focus, but I want a little bit more than that. So we're going to take some more pictures here. Um, and we'll process these right now just to see what we've got. So, uh huh. Coming back in here to show my screen so you guys can see it. So now we've taken a sequence, right? And this is pretty far back. I wanted to include everything in, in the flower. So I'm just going to go to export, helicon focus, and DNG. I'm going to hit export. And now there are three rendering methods. There's A, B, and C, correct? So I'm going to hit render under the A method, and we're going to see what happens in the right-hand pane here. Um, now, keeping in mind, there are, uh, there are many ways to process uh, macro photography, uh, including Lightroom and Photoshop and other third-party softwares. I happen to prefer Helicon Focus. Uh, for me, it provides the most consistent results, uh, so that's the one that I choose. I like to run through all of these and render A, B, and C because they each have their own qualities. And you'll see in the bottom left-hand corner, there's a blue progress bar showing you how far it's gotten in processing that. So that's what we're waiting for right now is to wait for all three of these to process. In the meantime, while that's doing its thing, we can go back and take a look through the camera. Uh, and now we're going to, uh, let's do this. We're gonna look through the camera and now we're going to go to one-to-one. -to -one. So uh, I want to extend the bellows as far as possible. And let me switch to this so you can see it. I wanna extend the bellows all the way And now I'm going to, uh, you could do this with a tripod, of course, too, but watching through the camera, I'm going to now increase, decrease the distance between the subject and the camera until the first part gets in focus. And I'm going to also make sure that my focusing rail is almost all the way at the top here so that I have room to go down also, but not all the way at the top. Uh, so what I'm doing is I'm moving the camera a little bit closer and closer. And we're going to have to change the exposure now because we increased the distance from the lens to the camera. And now we're also going to frame this up. What do you think would be beautiful? How about that? I like that. So we'll zoom in until we get close, right? And then we're going to use the focusing rail here to finesse it, right? And this is another, this is a good time to talk to you about this. Um, why do I have two focusing rails? Well, here we go. Because if I wanted to finesse going side to side, then I just use the cross part of the Castell cross Q, right? Oh, look at that. I got a little piece of dirt on my lens from leaving it open this whole time. And then this other one focuses in and out. So uh, I kind of like that right there. And a uh, pro tip, make sure you focus into your closest part first and make your composition there because everything else is going to get cut off when you stack. So now we'll focus to the closest part. And 
zoom in to look at it. Look at that. And go a little bit beyond. Yep. And this is where we will we'll start our stack from here. But now that we did that, let's go back to Helicon and see what happened. All right, so we have three different versions and we can sort of click in and see what happened here. And some of them may render edge detail better than the others. So what I usually just do here is go file, save all, and it's gonna save those DNGs back into the same folder that I had them in for Lightroom. So while it's doing that, let's go back and over here, while that is doing its saving thing, let's start our next macro sequence and see how that works out. So, uh-huh, great, three files saved, beautiful. So when you're done with Helicon, you just quit it and that's what gives the signal to Lightroom to add these back in. What you need to do is go to the folder in your library and then go uh, save, synchronize the folder. So let's see, synchronize folder. Once you do that, it's going to look for new images in that folder uh, and you sync them. But it seems like they're already there. So we'll find those. stuff Turn on our image here good all right back to shooting all right so now we've already picked our our closer focus one and we're going to go look at what this lens can do so give me a second um we're going to switch back to looking through the camera oh this is the side view now right that's a little precarious right <laughs> There we go. Good. All right. So, um, I don't like seeing that. Cool. All right, back to the camera. So now we're going to make this wonderful uh, sequence that we started here. And of course, this is the thrilling part of it, right? Uh, and I'm going to Lightroom and you'll just see that I'm going to take a bunch of pictures. I'm going to go move a little bit faster on this one. And talking my way through. Martin, if there's anything that you wanted to pop in and answer verbally while I'm shooting this sequence, please feel free. But here we are, taking pictures, having fun with the Zen. And I'm just going to switch to this view so you guys can see what I'm doing. So you can see all of them coming in. And I'm shooting tethered. You, of course, do not need to. Or probably in the field, you wouldn't choose to shoot tethered. So let's take a look at this latest one and see where we're focused. We're getting down around the edge of the bulb here, but this flat field lens is really showing that it's doing a great job of staying flat. And I, I took a lot of care uh, to make sure that everything was perpendicular and parallel when I was setting up shooting. It always helps to have a, uh, 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 what do you say, uh, a copy stand to do this. So, um, there we go. And the copy stand helps, but you can set yourself up for success in many ways. And yes, I just realized that I was giving myself more shots than I needed to because I was at f4.5. So I just stopped down two stops and compensated with the shutter speed. And we're gonna arrive at our destination a lot faster. But the, the bokeh on the out-of-focus areas is gorgeous. So here we are.
coming to the end of our sequence soon. Should we do macro Mondays? Just have like a live studio on Mondays? What do you think, guys? Let me know in the comments. Getting closer. And we're getting closer. Almost down to the end of the bulb here. This was a, a water-based flower that my wife and I found while we were kayaking. It had broken off and it was floating in the water. So I snagged it knowing that we would have something interesting to photograph. Some of the uh, interior parts of the flower are protected by this large bulb on the front uh, and have since, as it's drying out, started to fall out. So it's a lot of depth to it. And quite a large flower at probably three and a half inches across. So, all right. So, we took a bunch of pictures on this one. We're going to do the same thing and hit export and head out to Helicon. And 43 coming in this time. And we'll go back to method A while it's loading these up. And while you guys are doing that, I'm going to check back in here and I'm going to say, hello, this is my face. We've been looking through a camera this whole time. All right. All right. So now this is Brenda. Hi, Brenda. Hey, sorry to check. There's a, there's a uh, comment in the chat here uh, asking for uh, a more complete um Sort of definition of, of it says here i uh describe your complete setup i have no idea what you've got there all i see you're turning some knobs and clicking and then feeding the okay. energy to heliocon so sure so, yeah so if if you have a chance to do that i think that would be great sure sure Yep, I could do that. Uh, we'll do that while Helicon is processing this next set of images. You don't really need to watch software do its thing. Um, I'm going to repeat what I did before uh, in the background as this is happening. So since people wanted to know a little bit more about my setup, I'm going to turn it sideways and we could talk about that. So um, I can even break it down. It's pretty simple. Uh, on the front here, we have the lens that we're talking about today the 90 millimeter 4.5 Apple lens. That has a mount already for the Bell F, these bellows. And I'm going to, actually we'll just pull this out of, out of the whole thing so everybody can see it. And then we'll mount it up again if we're gonna take more pictures. All right, we'll take this out. Ta-da! All right. So looking at it this way, I'm gonna break it down piece by piece. So the first thing we have is the lens that we're working with today. I'll put that up front. The second thing that I have here, and I turn it off as I take it off, is my Nikon Z6. Sorry about hitting the mic there, folks. But I have my Nikon Z6 body on the back of the bellows. And then in between, I was only using part of it here because if I put this on the other front, this is the complete... Uh, kit that has a bell F and the retro adapter and the proper rings to put a Nikon Z lens on this. So this allows electronic pass through of all of that. But when you take off the retro adapter from here, you have the bell F bellows. And the bell F bellows here, which we're talking about, we're mounted on two different uh, focusing rails. And we'll come back to those, but this is the Bell F Bellows. Super compact. When you put them away, they're this small. And this plus this is what we're talking about today, is putting this lens 
on these bellows and then putting this camera on the back, which for me to do that with a Nikon Z, I need to have the retro adapter, but I'm only using one side of the retro adapter. I'm using the side that mounts on the body of the camera. So I'm reverse engineering that. So we have that and this, and then we mount the camera onto that. So this part will dangle because you need to have the Z. You could uh, put any camera on the back with the proper adapter here. What I put underneath this is focusing rails because we've talked about, for those of you who've uh, uh, attended this before, macro is quite hard without a focusing rail um, because your adjustments are minute. You can have a bellows and achieve focus, but when you have a focusing rail, you can then put this underneath your bellows and move it forward minutely back and forth like this using the adjustment knob here. These are both the same focusing rail, the Castell Q. This one just happens to have the cast fine, which is a larger tube on it to help you turn a little bit more slowly. And when you get the two of these together, you now have a Castell cross Q, which means you can lock this one down. Now you have the ability to adjust your camera side to side with the top one and forward and back with the bottom one. And then your camera mounts here, uh, which is where you put your bellows right here. So I'm building it in reverse. That was a good question. Yes, there's a lot of components here, but when you build it up one by one, uh, it seems to get a little bit easier. All right, and then to put the camera back on, we would find the correct end of the, the retro adapter. In this case, it's the one that has the lens, the body adapter on it. And then this simply seats in the bellows right there. And then we're back to shooting where I put this on the quick release adapter, which I mounted on uh, the Kaiser refro stand here. So now we're back to where we were. I hope that that helped everybody understand that we can, we will provide a list of all of the components here. I really only wanted to focus on the bellows and the lens today, but of course there's other things that make the whole job a lot easier. Great. I see that there's a lot of comments here. For everybody who uh, is seeing this and saying, I'm watching somebody take pictures, I did promise that this is a live studio and part of the process of taking photographs with macro is the process of taking pictures with macro. So bear with us as we do the actual thing that we're promising we'd do. I'm gonna go take a peek at Helicon and see where all of these are. I've got processing happening. Um, perhaps this would be interesting to watch. Uh, perhaps it wouldn't, but in the background, it's processing raw files for me right now so that we can see uh, some better stuff. So I'm going to just hop in and show you guys that right now. So. These three are done. I had the A, B, and C different versions of the stack happen. And I'm just gonna go file and save all to show you that again. Uh, same as the source file is where I want it to go. So I'm gonna hit okay. And it's gonna create those three separate DNG files and put them right back into that folder. And I'm waiting for the prompt to come back saying that it's done. And when that's done, I'll let you guys know. Uh, and we're going to go take a look at it. So, all right. In the meantime, while we're looking at that, I'm going to jump into uh, the Q and A. So the hey, first thing I'll question, Matt. Uh, yep. are, you using, are you using the mid-size Kaiser Slim like Plano there? I am. Okay. Yeah, this is the. Or is that the eight and a half by eleven? Uh, is that the small one? I just can't. Tell. This is My eight business. and a half by eleven. Yeah. Okay. No, that's fine. Yep. 
it, well, it's got nine inches on one side, and it's got yeah, yeah, it's nine, ten, eleven, twelve, yeah, eight and a half, eleven. Yep, great. Thank All you. right, so my pleasure. I know this is um, uh, as as photographers, we we built up our kit piece at a time, right? Um, over years, I've had new projects, new ideas, new requirements, and one piece at a time, I built myself up to be able to do this stuff. So. All right, let's see. Going into the questions real quick. The rest of the setup, got it. Mm -hmm. Adapters, okay, good. All right, so right now I'm going to go into Lightroom and I'm going to go find our uh, synchronized folder. I'm going to go find our, our images. So we have one, two, three. Great. So I'm going to share my screen again so you guys can see it. So this last image that we shot, here is the A version and the B version and the C version. And you'll see that there's differences usually in where the edges are and gradiated tr transitions happen. I'm just going to slowly switch between them. And this is all subjective. You decide which one looks better to you or which one you feel is the best one to take care of. Uh, so in this case, I would probably head right in and switch to something like landscape because I like that. And I would pull up some shadows and I would take a little bit of haze and a little bit of clarity and a little more highlights there. And now we've got a really sharp bulb, which of course, We've got the tips of the flower because I didn't shoot all the way through. And then it gets nice and soft down here. And we're coming through and we're seeing all of that. And yes, I shot a 3D object with this. Um, but I also, prior to this, went and shot that same map that I have. And this is a flat, flat, flat image. And I'm going to show you what I did in the tab here. There we go. In the notes, since it doesn't pass electronic information, this is at 4.5, and this is as square as I could get it. And we're going to look at it at 100%, so it's fair, and it's sharp. And at 4.5, and then we go to 5.6, and then we go to 11. So at f11, with as square as I could get it, and I'm sure it's just slightly off, at f11, I've got it completely sharp corner to corner. I've even got this nice scratch on the map that came out beautifully. And if I go beyond 100%, I could see the printing method that was used. And I can see that there's no chromatic aberration happening here. But if I head back up here and look at, let's say, something like this, I just want to show you this in greater detail. This is a an image where uh, it's the 50 millimeter and it gets really super uh, not flat, right? <laughs> uh-huh. Uh, there we go. Good. All right. So uh, what else do we have in the Q&A? Uh, Greg asked, I said I'd taken enough photos. Does that mean adding additional photos to the stack will not improve the final stack damage? No, Greg, it just meant that at that point, I personally stopped, decided to stop shooting because I didn't need anything else in focus at that point. And I also wanted to be respectful of your guys' time to make sure that um, you weren't just watching me take pictures. Uh, the whole process here is to, to show the, the lens in use uh, to show the process of what it is. For those of you who have not experienced what it's like to work with a bellows and uh, a lens that's mounted just for the bellows, one that's not specifically for a camera, uh, for a flange mount, then uh, then that's that. Hey, Matt. So, Matt, yep. Question, buddy. Uh, what yeah. copy stand are you using there? Do you remember which one that is? I do. It's probably right here on the back. This is the 5411. Okay, so uh, for, for you guys in the US, uh, item number is 205411. I'll put the link in the 
chat here and for the rest of you, 5411 on the German site. Uh, and uh, let's see, one more. Uh, Matt, did you call attention to the level that you're using on your cold shoe there? I did not. Um, this this level is uh, this level is something that I've I picked up. Gosh, I forget where. Um, it's just a, it's a triple level. And let's see if my there we go. This one has three axes. Um, it's I think it's a, a generic one. I'm I don't know if if we carry one of these, but I've had it for years and years and years. There is a a dual level that came with my um, with the, uh, pano kit that I have that would also work perfectly for this. But what I was really looking for is, and there's two things you can do. You set it down on the table that you're shooting and see if it's level there first, and then you put it on the hot shoe of your camera and then see if it's level there. And then you put it on the back of your camera and see if it's level there also to see how many different planes you're actually working with. And if you put a slightest bit of pressure, you know, on whatever you're working with, whatever setup you have, how far does it go out of true, you know, whether you need to make adjustments. Um, yeah, this, this triple spirit level has come in really handy and I usually keep two of these. Uh, yeah. Two of these with me at all times. So. Yeah. I use one of those little short, uh, uh, it's not a torpedo level, but it's about the same size as a torpedo level. So I can turn it up, you know, on its end. So, uh, yeah, having those multiple axes is really, really important, isn't it? Great. And uh, this is live, folks. This is live. I had to make a, a battery change in my camera. All right. Cool. So, yes, we went over a lot of fun stuff. Um, and I know there's a, a lot more of questions. And it's funny. I was, I was demonstrating some pretty specific things, but introducing some, some other pieces in here, such as the, the copy stand. Uh, I used this specifically so I would be uh, parallel and uh, perpendicular to the to the subjects as I was shooting flat things. Um, it is a very common and popular thing to take the Kaiser Slim Light Planos and use that as a backlight for sh photographing flowers and other macro objects. Um, this is common and popular. I think a lot of people do it. And for those of you who are seeing it for the first time, enjoy. It's wonderful to have this very slim, perfectly even backlit. Uh, object uh, backlight to use behind. You just need to add a little bit of light in front of it too. Sometimes. Cool. So, um, all right. So we have lots and lots of information uh, on our website uh, and I'm going to check to see if there's some more Q and a. So uh, in the Q and a is asking if my camera is not tilted. I did my very, very best using that, that bubble level on the different levels to make sure that everything was as flat as possible. Um, setting up to make sure you're absolutely level in the very beginning and being very careful to test through that. If you have to do something that should be absolutely parallel and perpendicular, it's probably the hardest part of everything else is pretty academic. Once you get that perfectly perpendicular, you're great. Uh, so, there's more tricks to that. In this case, I use the bubble level. Some people throw a mirror down there so that they can see it. Um, there's, there's other tricks that you can get into. Coming back to it, uh, what I've found is that um, despite all of the, the things I've, I've thought about before, I'm really hooked on this. Uh, this lens, the 90 millimeter APO, uh, is, is my macro lens now. Um, I really prefer having this, uh, and I really love the results from it. And going forward, it's going to be my macro lens of choice. Um, if you have questions about that lens or how to connect that with the bellows or anything else, please let us know. You can even respond to the emails uh, from the webinar, or you can leave a comment if you're watching this as a replay. 
Uh, so what else do we have? If it's a question of one-to-one -one macro, could it persuade me to use this lens instead of a regular, regular macro lens? Well, I see Martin is answering that one. It just disappeared. Yeah, yeah, I could. Uh, if you ever change camera bodies, you'd be using the same lens and bellows, and all you need to do is get a different camera adapter. Um, I think that that and shooting it side by side, checking the quality to see if it's something that meets or exceeds your expectations would be another way to go about determining if that's for you. Okay. Yeah, uh, Dennis is asking, uh, is a flat field macro lens the best way to go when photographing a 3D image? Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, the, part of this is technical and part of this is aesthetic slash personal decisions, right? So if you're shooting a three-dimensional object like we just did with a, a flat field lens, it's going to make certain things that are in focus in focus and certain things are out of focus, out of focus, right? You're going to see that the colors don't separate in the out of focus area, which just exactly what they're looking for. Other people do like that effect where the, the colors start to fringe at the edges. It might be something that you like. If you don't like it, once you see it, you can't unsee it. Once you've experienced that, you may decide that that's the way that you want to go and that an Apo lens and a flat field Apo lens is exactly the right thing for you. When you're doing critical uh, focus stacking, absolutely, this is the choice. Um, when you're doing three-dimensional objects like flowers, if you want those colors to be exactly what they were, you definitely want an Apo corrected lens and the flat field and the apple come together here. So those two qualities are married in this lens. Uh, so for three-dimensional objects, I think that you're going to get better stitches out of an Apo flat field lens than you would out of something that didn't have as much correction applied to it. Any other questions? All right. Well, uh, then I'm just gonna I'm gonna come in for a landing then. Um, so uh, this we 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 answered a lot of questions, right? So it's uh, we had a lot of fun. If you want to see some of my personal work, it's Matt Hallart. If you want to see some of the stuff I didn't show at all in this webinar, which is the night photography that's National Parks at Night. Um, thank you for watching. You've been great. I know there's a lot of questions and we look forward to answering more of them. Thanks, Matt. This has been really good for me and I really appreciate it. Thank you, Brenda. Thanks for being here and helping us out. Uh, and Martin, thank you for attending from Germany, even on holiday. We appreciate that. Sorry, I think that Martin had a little bit of a, an internet issue, uh, yeah. but it's good to have a, a, whole, uh, a whole team here helping. Um, thank you, Constant attendees for those of you who always show up i appreciate you your questions only make us better and we wouldn't do it if you didn't show up so thanks for that if you're seeing this as a replay thanks for being here uh consider coming to novaflexus.com and signing up for a mailing list uh have a great day and uh we'll see you at the next webinar uh thank you be well